hear my voice, there is not anything in your life, there is not anything in your life that God cannot fix and make new. Sometimes Christians do funny things without thought. You know, it has nothing to do with the spirit, it just has to do with the vessel. Um, and, uh, and so, <laughs> tell you tonight is that although you have felt forgotten, you are not forgotten. You've been hidden and you're here on divine purpose. Declare a thing and it shall be established, but it doesn't say declare a good thing and it shall be established. It says declare a thing. And so many times I think what we're desire to march with us, we want you there. Not only do we want you there, we need you. We need you. You fill a place void without your presence. It's just, it's good to be home. I've been, uh, been traveling quite a bit over the course of the last year and speaking in some different churches. And how many of you know that uh, not everybody does things the way we do them here? You never know how somebody's going to worship. You never know how the, the, the environment's going to be. You know, you know I mean, and, and I don't have any problem. I'm going to say right up front. I'm not, I, I love the charismatic movement. I love charismatic expression. I love everything that's associated with it. So please don't misinterpret what I'm about to say, okay? But some of my experience has been that uh, uh, charismatic people are dangerous <laughs> in their worship practices, and I have to set down, lay down some ground rules, at least while I'm in the pulpit. And rule number one, so anybody who might be inclined this way, just understand that tonight it's off limits. No running with the shofar. <laughs> that, they call it a shofar because if you fall while running with it, it will go shofar down your throat. <laughs> nothing, nothing disrupts the service like them having to pull paddles out in the back and zap the guy who has a shofar halfway down. You understand what I'm saying? So no running with the shofar. My second rule is, because most pastors ask me to sit on the front row, is that anybody who's going to be waving flags in the front row has to do it with their eyes open. You know, I, I, I realize that it's just, you know, that just because the Bible says that you can do all things through Christ doesn't mean you should try. That's, that's in, some, in some circles, ninjas, that's called a bow staff. And it's a weapon, and it's very dangerous. I don't want to have to wear a full-face helmet on the front row to keep from getting zapped in the eye by your pole. Keep your worship javelin in your area. As I said earlier, that everybody, everybody experiences the Holy Spirit differently. And, uh, and I'm cool with that. But the last thing that I usually ask people who are in my service with me is that if you're sitting directly behind me, please, please, please do not, when the, when, when the, the minister, the worship leader says, let out a crazy pr praise, please, please, please do not scream like you just got stuck with a prison shank. <laughs> that scares people. It scares people when somebody just screams like they're dying. I had a lady do that in one service. I nearly knocked the wig out of the bobby pins and the lady in front of me. You know, I, come, come on. So the point is, being here in my home church, I know what to expect. And it's just so good to be home. I love you guys. I love you guys. All right. On a serious note, let's. When I look at the Bible, there's some things that I question sometimes. I go, wow, what, what in the world happened? And I'm going to share a few of those tonight. First of all, let's think about something. Jesus, his first sermon was called the Sermon on the Mount. Does anybody know why they called it the Sermon on the Mount? He had to climb a mountain to teach because he had so many people following him. Now, this is confusing to me because... This was his first sermon. I've been preaching for 20 years. I've never had to climb a mountain to have anybody listen to me. And you guys will say, well, he was the son of God. I would propose that nobody knew that. It was his first sermon. I would also propose that the people that were there at the base of the mountain that were listening to him on the Sermon of the Mount didn't have any idea he was the son of God because once they found that out, they tried to kill him. 
So we look at things from fast forward backward, but let's take it in context. Why are all these people following this guy? Jesus says, hey. She looks up, woman, where are your accusers? She says, there's, there, there's none, Lord. I don't, I don't see any. He says, neither do I accuse you. Now, here's the thing. In order for there to be conviction of a crime in Jewish culture, there had to be two witnesses or accusers. Now, Jesus, he didn't take away what happened. He didn't, take, he didn't, he didn't contradict the Torah. What he did was he just simply took away the accusers. She couldn't be convicted. It was a mistrial at that point because her accusers were no longer there. My dad used to always tell me, son, one day you're going to meet somebody and uh, he's basically going to, he's going to clean your clock. What I didn't know is that that guy that I was going to meet would be my mom. In the recent past, during her free time, she had been entering into the Matrix <laughs> and taking Kung Fu lessons from Morpheus. Brrr, and I couldn't block. I couldn't see where it was coming from. All I could do was scream. Ah! Well, I woke up when I was 17, and uh, mom said, my name is yes, ma'am. The belt held all your weapons, and so let's go ahead and trade our, shoot. I didn't think this out very clearly. It's just... The belt holds all your weapons, including your 45 Kimber. I should have took that off. I don't know what I was thinking. And feeling frustrated one night about 18 months ago, I asked God, I said, God, don't you think I've been in this season a long time? And just as clear as day, I heard the Holy Spirit say, and it actually made me laugh. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. I can tell you right where I was standing. I was walking right in front of my utility room towards my bedroom, just kind of feeling a little frustrated. I said, God, don't you think I've been in this season a long time? And the Holy Spirit said, Aaron, you had a lot to unlearn. You had a lot to unlearn. And I literally, it hit me so funny that I laughed. I mean, it was the last thing I was expecting to hear. I was expecting something like, yes, son but I'm with you. <laughs> but no, the Holy Spirit says, you had a lot to unlearn. And, and I laughed and I said, okay, well, if that's what this is about, then let's get the unlearning done. Uh, talking about clothes here, I went to the, what's it, the buckle to go and buy some of them pretty pocket preacher pants, you know, that most, pre most preachers wear. And uh, I'm gonna tell you something, if you're over a size 36, they're just not made for you. A button fly turns into a padlock. <laughs> it, just, it just ain't happening. I had a, when I came home, my wife said, what are you doing? Why are you wearing Daisy Dukes? I said, I'm trying to cut these things off. They won't come. Yeah. You just pictured me in Daisy Dukes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Oh, where's this service going already? That did not happen first service. Oh, man. My God, my supply. You are as close as the air that I'm breathing, and I stop and I become aware of you. Whew. His heart is to progress you. Where the devil tried to steal, kill, and destroy God, Jesus says, I come that you may have life and have it to the full. And I'll take those broken pieces, I'll take those strongholds, I'll take those situations that the devil's placed in your life that to, to try to disrupt your destiny. And not only will I take those things and mend them and make them better, but I'll actually use them as the catalyst for your future. I'll use those things that the devil intended to, to destroy your life with, and I'll use it to propel your ministry into its next level. I'll, I'll take years that the devil intended to destroy you, and I'll advance you years in your progress that you could have never, have never experienced any other way. I'll use that circumstance to propel you. That's, that's the God that we serve. So while we're trying to carry this burden on ourselves and we're trying to hide this load, he's saying, cast your cares on me because I care for you. Give it to me. I know what it feels like like many of you, to look in a mirror and not like who I see looking back. I've looked in the mirror 
and saw the flaws. I've looked in the mirror and thought failure. When we continue failure. to call ourselves stupid, when we continue to call ourselves worthless, when we continue to see ourselves as less than what God sees us, we find ourselves walking that out because our perception determines our reception. Naturally, you are going to live defeated if that's your expectation. If you don't know you can win, if you don't realize you can win, if you don't understand that you can win, and your experience has always been failure, then naturally, that is going to be what you're going to struggle with feeling. If you are not living bound by a stronghold, it is only because you have learned how to it's defeat the it. the same stinking stuff that trips me up every time. Stronghold! But you see, we have this mentality, we've bought into this lie, this deception, this stronghold that the devil has spoken into our lives, that we have to be something that we're not. When Jesus nailed himself, allowed himself to be nailed to a cross, when he spilled his blood, when he took lashes upon his back, when his side was pierced, he did it so that you didn't have to be bound by sin. You are not defined by your past anymore. You may define yourself, the devil may define you by it, but I'm telling you right now, according to God, you are not defined by your past. That's why you're not a sinner saved by grace. You were a sinner who's saved by grace. If you believe that you are subject to sin, you will never live in victory over it. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. He went to the cross so we didn't have to be bound by sin. That's why he went I no there. I'm no longer defined by that time in my life. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, I speak in authority over the circumstances. I speak in authority over those problems. I speak in authority over those sinful thoughts and notions that the devil tries to bring against me. I don't have to sin. I don't have to be subject to this. I can choose to be, but I don't have to be. Jesus said it is finished, and that's what he meant. It's finished. The past is gone. I've provided freedom. Now, some of you have walked in bondage for so long that you don't understand what it means to be free. You don't understand how to reach that place of freedom. You don't understand how to get there, but I'm here to tell you it's yours for the taking.